We're here today on October the 26th, 2022, to talk with Justice Gorman Houston, who is retired from the Alabama Supreme Court. My sister Millie Houston and I will be uh, discussing with our father his virtually entire adult life, which was as part of the legal community, most of it here in the state of Alabama, from his time at law school at the University of Alabama until he graduated in 1956, his time when he served on the staff of the Chief Justice of the Alabama Supreme Court before he went to the Judge Advocate General's office in the United States Air Force. In 1960, he returned to his hometown of Eufaula, Alabama and opened a law practice where he practiced for 25 years until in 1985, Governor George C. Wallace appointed him as an Associate Justice to the Alabama Supreme Court. He served on the Supreme Court and ultimately became the senior associate justice and served an in interim as chief justice of the Alabama Supreme Court. When he reached the retirement age, mandatory retirement age in the state of Alabama, he retired from the Supreme Court, but not from the legal profession. He went on staff of a law firm in Birmingham until he retired just a few years ago. That's an awful lot and virtually all of his adult life. My sister Millie and I will be talking with our dad about the motivators and influencers and guides, the people who attracted him into the legal profession and shaped and influenced both his legal philosophy and his practice of law. So we'll begin at the top and I'll ask you which of the United States Supreme Court Chief Justices has had the greatest influence on your philosophy and practice of law? I was born on March the 11th, 1933, and uh, I was surprised to learn that uh, I was older than two of the justices who were on the United States Supreme Court at that time. And uh, one was, uh, Antoine uh, Scalia, who was born on March the 11th, 1936, or three years after I was born, and the other was Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who was born on March the 15th, 1933, four days after I was born. I was pleased to learn that Justice Scalia and Justice Ginsburg were the best of friends, and uh, Though, and they had different judicial philosophies, uh, more than miles apart. Justice uh, Scalia was a uh, conservative, and Justice Ginsburg was a liberal. I admire both of them, and re they remain two of my very favorite justices. Okay. That's great. Well, let's talk a little bit about the, the influences that led you to pursue um, a life in the legal profession, I guess from your earliest days, perhaps, growing up in Eufaula, Alabama. Um, how, did you, how did you make your way into the legal community? Well, I was very close to my grandfather, uh, who was a doctor. Uh, Dr. James Lafayette Houston. And I lived next door to him at the Bluff City Inn in Eufaula, which he owned. And uh, I spent a lot of time with him. When I was two years old, I remember that uh, Dr. Houston bought a large cotton plantation, which was closer to Eufaula than the many farms that he owned near Coma, Alabama, and he named it the Jackson Place. And the first time Dr. Houston uh, took me to the Jackson Place, he had a, a person who worked in the hotel to drive us. And he sat in the back seat and I stood next to him <laughs> and he had his arm around me and I had my hand on his shoulder and we uh, went over a bridge that had a horrible noise and I'd grabbed 
my grandfather just as strong as I possibly could uh, to try to get some something contained. And all of a sudden, here came this voice. Shall we gather at the river, the beautiful, the beautiful river? Gather with the saints at the river that flows by the throne of God. And I calmed down and was fine after that song. And we sang it. Every time we went over that bridge, we back and forth, we would sing that song. Uh, and it was uh, a, a good encouragement for me. And what I would have to do there, I would play with the children whose parents had picked the cotton and whose, uh, whose my grandfather had weighed and paid for the cotton. And uh, I was four years old when Linus was asked to take my grandfather to middle Florida to visit his two sisters. And he was driving there and there had no cattle law back then and cattle were in the road way. He, he pulled out of the road to try to miss one and hit a tree. And my grandfather was injured and uh, uh, very seriously so. They brought him to uh, Eufaula, and he was in the hospital on the bluff in Eufaula. And my daddy picked me up and took me to see him. And I looked at him there. He, his eyes were closed. He wasn't saying anything, of course. And I realized later that he was dying. And I started crying, and that was it, I remember. It was awfully hard to take, and I, I just uh, remember that as something that I will never, never forget. And Daddy, after um, Dr. Houston's death, his will was set up in a way, of course it was unexpected, but he did have a will, and how did that impact the family? Well, it, it had a very serious impact on the family, as you all will probably know. Uh, he, he was worth a great deal of money because really your, your land at that time was, you know, was, was the thing you really wanted to have. We didn't have much of a stock market. And, right. and he, uh, he, he just, uh, he had it maintained. The strange thing about it is that when I grew older, I was told by people in the barber shop, which was part of the Bluff City Inn on the ground floor that uh, was owned by my grandfather, that uh, he had left the Jackson place to me. And that he had told him, all of them there that he had left the Jackson place to me. And of course this was several years after his death, you know, and I never, never challenged that. Uh, I just, uh, I, I never saw the will, hmm. never saw his will, but it was uh, an interesting, interesting experience. But his will left the property to his sons and then one of his to all three of his sons. Well, he left them to his, that's right, to his a life estate, to his wife, and to his three sons. Right. And, and uh, then, then it went to, you know, their children and so forth. And so in your family, mm -hmm. your father died early in his 40s and Instead of it passing down to your mother, it actually went to you and your brother and sister. That's correct. Which, how did that affect your family? Well, we helped my mother um, to make sure that everything was all right there. And it, uh, it, it, was, it was right hard. Actually, he, my father, 
managed everything. He managed the hotel and he managed the, car, the farms in Coma and the farm in the Jackson place. And so he was in charge of it. He was actually climbing a fence with a loaded gun when it went off and hit him right in the neck. And uh, he, he died, he was by himself. He was going across to a pond that we had to fish. And it was and you actually- were in law school at I was time. in law school mm -hmm. at, at the time. And uh, so we found that out. And an interesting thing happened. Uh, Hank and Louise Connor lived two doors down from my parents, and they were close friends from my, with my parents all for a long time. And they became, became uh, particularly close after this. And uh, they took, Hank took the bloody clothes of my father to, an, to their attic and put it in their attic because we did not have an attic in the house that would protect from, protect it, you know. So the thing that's right interested in there, they are, they are buried next to mama and daddy. And uh, it, it's right interesting because uh, Nell's sister turned out to Louise's be, sister. Louise's sister, right. turned out to be uh, Nell Harper Lee. Harper Lee. Mm. Nell Harper Lee. And we were very close to Nell Harper Lee uh, for a long time. We, we would pick her up at the train station in Atlanta and bring her to Eufaula. We visited her several times in Birmingham where she was a patient there. We visited her many times in Monroeville and uh, she visited me at the Supreme Court in Montgomery and before her death, she, I wrote Nell Harper Lee and we for family and friends. This is the book that I gave to so many people that we have no more. And I gave all the letters from Nell Harper Lee to the state of Alabama Department of Archives and History. And they are listed, listed there. Uh, one letter that struck me mightily was uh, ended. Lastly, thank you for you. So long as you are around, there will be one voice of reason, sanity, and Christian principle. My love to you and Martha, Nell. And that is a, a treasure. A, a treasure. That's that, right. That, That's a great uh, tribute. Uh, yeah. Let's talk for a minute about the role of faith in your life. You've uh, been active in the church all your life. Uh, uh, has that had an influence of your decision to enter law, to pursue justice and so forth? Or uh, how did, uh, tell us about your faith. I, well, I am, I'm not as good as I should be. <laughs> that, that, that is a fact now. And I spend less time with the church. We used to open the church and close the church <laughs> for many, many years there in Eufaula and even in Montgomery when we were up here. But we just sort of got tied, uh, I, I mean, sort of. Faith, Daddy, your personal faith, personal which faith. guided. Yeah, well, we just, uh, we just were. Very active. Very active. Mm -hmm. And the faith was very strong. There were probably various people, pastors and bishops and lay people who influenced you greatly and all of that. Another person who influenced me greatly was you who went into the ministry. <laughs> and we, were, <laughs> we made sure we attended church that you had any time that, that we possibly could and enjoyed it very much. Hmm. Uh, but it's, uh, it, 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 
it is a part of my life, a big, big part of my life, and a big, big part of Martha's life. And we, we're in Millie's backyard, and we hear the chimes every 15 minutes from the uh, place that is there, First Methodist, First Methodist. First Methodist mm -hmm. Church, that is, they, I guess they're situated uh, at, at the Calabarium, aren't they? They're, on the, they're on the, in a tower. On, on, the, on the top yeah. of it, yeah. So anyway, that, there's a calivarium that we will be buried in, mm -hmm. and it's just interesting to be able to sit in Millie's backyard on wonderful furniture and listen to the chimes That's ring right. every 15 minutes. You have to kind of be religious to do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, and neither you nor um, our mother has spent a lot of time telling everybody how strong their faith is. You just lived it out. Well, I'm not sure we lived it out, but she did, but she has, but I have not. But anyway, I, 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 I try. There you go. Well, let's talk about those years. You mentioned some of the growing up memories you have. Uh, what do you think influenced you to pursue law school, to go into law school? There were easier ways to make a living, but how did you choose that? I, I'm not sure exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to Auburn. Daddy, my father, whom I was very close to, uh, he, he went to Auburn and I went to Auburn and I pledged the same fraternity that he had pledged and was very active in that. And it just uh, was uh, an, an you know, mm -hmm. interesting time uh, to be there, but I realized all of a sudden that I wanted to go to law school. Mm -hmm. And I don't know exactly where it came from or why, but it, it was strong, and I applied to the university and was accepted. And uh, I remember my father was very pleased with that. Mm -hmm. And he, um, he actually uh, favored that, and we, we thought that it was something, you know what I mean, that we, we would, and would enjoy. Mm -hmm. right. I was picked as one of the four of the senior class at law school to appear before the Alabama Supreme Court. The Chief Justice and the court came up to Tuscaloosa and had a, uh, had a, had a particular ceremony that we went through. And anyway, the two of oh, us... Yeah, the mock trial that we won, the one trial I was on, mm -hmm. and Chief Justice Livingston uh, offered me a job as uh, his clerk. Mm -hmm. And I accepted that and uh, went there to Montgomery, which was, and, and the clerk's office was right next to the Supreme Court building then, the old building. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, I was over at the old building a lot right. at the time, as, as well as um, this this part of the building. And so you clerked there for about a year, is that right? And Almost then a year, and then I had I went to uh, the Air Force, right? And was, was a legal officer in and the Judge Air Force, Advocate Jad, General. Judge Advocate General, and was there for three years. Mm -hmm. And it was there that uh, you were born. Right. And, <laughs> and you were born, and a very, Millie was born uh, when we were there in Montgomery. Mm -hmm. You were born when we were in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. And it just so happened that the uh, time that you were supposed to be born, we made, we made arrangements so that Millie could go to you follow and be with Martha's mother and, and, and her. And you didn't come. <laughs> so Easter happened, and Martha hadn't gotten her Easter dress, so she had a big hat, I remember that, and she decided that she would uh, decorate it a little for us to go to church. So she did with, with uh, oh, uh, yeah, just, just flowers, flowers mm -hmm. altar flowers. And we went in, everything was fine. We were seated, the singing was over, 
And just about that time, buzz, and a bee flew out of <laughs> of the flower up and then around the church. And everybody in the church was, you know, doing like that. And Martha was climbing under the pew almost. You know. Anyway, you came the next day <laughs> hurriedly. I, I had to I took her to the hospital and before I could get all of the or uh, things handled mm -hmm. there, you were born, and they were bringing you out, and they had, and we were not planning to name you the third, mm -hmm. but you looked exactly like your father, my father did, at, when you were born, and so we insisted on, you know, mm -hmm. being James Gorman Houston the third. So your time there in the Air Force. Um, I think at one point you told me that uh, some of the grim work was like making wills for soldiers who would go to Vietnam and so forth. Uh, any other memorable times there necessarily in the Air Force? Well, uh, I was a first lieutenant and ended up as a captain. Uh, but Martha, for example, was president of the Wives Club, mm -hmm. and she would uh, she was at the uh, house. <laughs> where the the wife of the highest man on the bear stayed, and she was a good friend of her. They played golf together and what have you. Anyway, so we would I would be called to come over there, and and it was interesting to see. And <laughs> had a good connection. Had a good connection the, there. All right. So you moved from. Uh, being with the Air Force back to your hometown. Again, your father had died, your mother was there, um, and your younger brother, and That's so right. forth. And so you moved back and opened a law practice there. Right. Yes. Um, and so tell us some things about s establishing a law practice in 1960. Well, it was, it was rather interesting. We were just, I mean, it would be everything from uh, actual, you know, trials to uh, uh, preparation of uh, uh, all sorts of closing things, of, you deeds. know, deeds and things of that nature. So you did just about every type just of law. Every, every, every type, okay. it surely was. And you moved to Eufaula about the time the Chattahoochee River was dammed up and the lake was formed, That's right. about the time the civil rights movement was getting going, all sorts of things that had huge influence on That's that right. small town. That's right. Any reflections on how that town shaped or determined, and those events shaped or determined your practice of law? <laughs> well, it shaped and determined in a, in a strange way. And that uh, <clears throat> on... One day I was asked to, I was hired to, to go to Atlanta with clients who owned a large tract of timberland mm -hmm. in, in Barber County and they were selling it to a company there in Atlanta. So we got on the road and they had somebody who took us up there from you fall a, a patient drove us up, and then uh, we, <laughs> we got there, we finished the work that we had to do. I received a call from Martha saying, Gorman, I've just talked to Governor George Wallace, and he wants to appoint you to the Alabama Supreme Court, <laughs> but you have got to be on the steps of the Capitol by six o'clock tonight said it is absolutely essential or it all may have fall apart, you know. And so I was sort of astounded. I went and talked to my clients first and they said, by all means go, you know what I mean? And, and they had somebody to ride and take them back to Montgomery. I mean, back to Eufaula. And I uh, had the people who found out about it at the law firm, they were the nicest thing in the world. They called the airport. They reserved a plane. They had somebody to get me out to the airport. And um, Millie came and picked me up and carried me to the steps of the Capitol. And there I was 
named. Named, as you know. So it sounds like it was total surprise. Absolute total surprise, <laughs> all in <laughs> half a day as well as what right. it amounted to. That was to. in 1985. That's right, in okay. 1985. Right. And then uh, that was it. Yeah. So, and so then, uh, Let's step back for one more second to your to your time practicing law. Uh, at, prior to being on the court, you had done both plaintiff work and defense work. Yes. Is that correct? correct? As well as lots of land titles and deeds and work of that nature, exactly. setting up estates, working a lot with the county right. and with the city, um, well, particularly I was, I industrial. Was for the county board of commissioners mm -hmm. too, and also had, had served as. Uh, uh, as a, as a uh, law clerk for the city of Eufaula. Mm -hmm. And on the Industrial Development on Board. On the Industrial Development Board. And those yes. were times that were key for that small town in terms of industrial development and in terms of the city becoming uh, more prosperous. Right. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the land had, had been... Um, the uh, United States government, I guess, had had to purchase land in order to flood it for That's the correct. for the lake that was begun. Yeah. Uh, were you involved in any of that or no? I was not involved in actually doing it, but I was involved in having it done to us. Okay. So we and and we received good money for it, mm -hmm. you know. So some of those um, farmlands that your grandfather had purchased and owned were flooded, flooded. and exactly. so then. Uh, the land was condemned by the government and purchased. Okay, yeah. And so then uh, go through all of that and you, you land at the Supreme Court here in Montgomery. Right. Okay, and that was in 1985 and you were on the court for 20 years roughly, right? Exactly. right. Okay, and so let's talk about uh, influences in those years. Any uh, particular justices or others that uh, you became close to or that you uh, enjoyed working with? Yes. Well, most of them I enjoyed working with. And I have the, uh, let's see, I was on, oh, I've forgotten exactly how many courts, mm -hmm. but we would, you know, be a different court every time one person would change right. a position. And I was on at least uh, 15 or 16. I thought you know. it was a lot. So it was a lot of them. But, uh, Bo Talbot, of course, was was my favorite. He was chief justice at the time. Sam Beatty, uh, and people like that, who had been a mm -hmm. law professor and so forth, and was a was a good friend, and and just a lot of them. Right, yeah. and it's interesting to me because you had uh, both those who would be more uh, favored the plaintiffs viewpoint and those defense viewpoints on the court and yet you all seem to work very well together and kind of like you were talking about with uh, Ginsburg and Alito working well together even though they had different philosophies. Exactly. Same type thing happened here in the state? It did happen here in the state. We did have one controversy. Okay. Yeah, and that was the erection of the monument. With the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandment Monument. Mm -hmm. uh, Tell us about how that happened. Well, I came in from work one day. I was senior associate justice at the time. Came home from work, and uh, the person who was in charge of the building was there at my door waiting to see me, and he said, we've got to go down to the lobby. And so uh, I went with him, and there in the lobby was this monument mm -hmm. um, and I, I was overcome with it and the main thing I wanted to make sure that none of the building had been destroyed by it I mean it was a heavy thing you know so I had him and he and I went to make sure followed tracks and made sure that there was no problem and got some people up to look at it mm -hmm. and uh, we, we did that and, and there was no damage right? there was no damage mm -hmm. from it from that, but it was a terrible damage from with everything else that was going on. So uh, after that, it was in the in the uh, rotunda area, right, the lobby area, rotunda very area. public area. And after that, uh, as I understand or remember, a lawsuit was brought to have that removed. Is that yeah, correct? Yeah. And I guess a federal court ruled it should be removed. Is that federal what court happened? Ruled it should be removed. Correct. And so, so then. 
it was removed? Is that what happened? It was removed. That's right. And it was the property of uh, the person, you know, the, the lawyer who had it. And of course, one thing he was uh, claiming says, oh, the federal court has a monument do it out front of it, you know, mm -hmm. talking about the monument in the court here. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, that was entirely different. I mean, that had, had nothing to do with what had happened because actually there had been a suit filed against him mm -hmm. while he had that. And, and there would have been an order saying that he had to remove it, it had to be removed. And that was when we had the real hard time of not doing. Yeah. We had people there in the yard. I mean, they would stay night and day. Uh, and we would have to go in and out, and it was like, you know, Dangerville. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was... A, a, a tremendous demonstration. Oh, yes. Ongoing for days, weeks. Oh, yes, yes. And yes. these were people who were supporting keeping the, keeping monument, the monument there. As it was. Okay. And yet there was a ruling that ordered it to be removed. Alabama, uh, a, a, a court had ruled, a federal state had ruled that it had to be removed. And there was a financial penalty for not removing it every week or whatever it would go up. Is that correct? correct. Double, I think. is. Yes, it was. And so, but it was, um, and it resulted in the Chief Justice being removed from office. Is that correct? That's correct. And so let's talk about that part of it because um, there was a very different, I guess, viewpoint, philosophy there. Mm -hmm. um, once he was removed, you were named interim chief justice. That's that right. Correct? Yeah. And then it was, and the building was a specialty for me because when I was elected to the court, I mean, when I went on the court, we were in the old building. Right. And, and I was there on the court while we drew up the plan for the new court. Everything was done for it. We would walk, walk over, you know, have pictures taken of us digging things and uh, putting in bricks and what have you. So it was, a, it was an effort by the justices on the court to try to have this new building. Mm -hmm. And it, it was just ridiculous that uh, someone could come in, do something, get a court order saying you have to take it out and have all these people just come down and just, you know, <coughs> excuse me, be really worried about mm -hmm. some people. I worried. And there was some I, worry about your own personal safety, wasn't there? Well, yes, I had some problem with a car that was done and mm -hmm. went to, uh, but, you know, right. it, 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 it didn't matter. So um, the, the, the monument was not removed immediately as it was supposed to be. The chief justice was removed. You were named chief justice. And then you had to make a decision about what to do with the monument. Did you consult the other justices? Oh, it had been moved, oh, it had been moved it had been by moved. then. Yes. Did, did you moved, all consult? Immediately. Who made that decision? Well, I did. Did you do that by yourself or with the other justices? Other justices. Okay. And when All of the other justices realized we would recognize, they recognize that, you see what I mean, as, as something that should not have been right. done. And whether we agreed with it or not, it was a court order that had right. been issued and we were going to obey that court order. So the issue here was not your religious position necessarily, but it was your respect for the rule of law. Exactly. Okay. And so then that was removed and ultimately returned to the owner? Owner. And, okay. and as I understand it, it uh, he made a good bit of money out of it with the trailer, taking it up and down all over the United States, I guess. Political rallies. Political rallies. But I mean, they had big rallies out in front of the court. It was, it, it was rather amazing. When the monument came in, were all the justices um, um, consulted and notified so that they knew that it was coming, or was it oh, a surprise? No, no, none of us were. Oh. Only, only he knew okay. that it was coming in. And you all did not see it going in. No, uh -uh. it was. It went in at night. Okay. Went in at night, and uh, the thing that I 
this is a beautiful building, you know, and, and it has a beautiful area there in the that in which the block, I mean, the uh, monument was placed. And I just was afraid that the floor was right. going to be ruined for having gotten it in there. Mm. But somehow they did it without uh, damage to the building. That's really good. Well, that was quite a, an event, oh, right? That was an event, yes. <laughs> and then you were Chief Justice for the remainder of that term until a new Chief Justice was elected. Is that That's correct? Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when you look back on the entire scope of the 20 years or so you were on the court, um, any, any other memories or, or reflections that would be important? Only good ones. There you go. <laughs> That's the only bad mm -hmm. reflection I had, but uh, that, that was scary. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was scary and it just worried me for what would happen and we were fighting the federal court, you know what right. I mean? And uh, we don't do that. Right. Difficult to, um, to ignore um, <laughs> a, an order if you are then going to expect people to obey your orders, right? right. Yes. So, so uh, that was a fascinating chapter in the history yes. of the court and of, uh, of that whole movement, I guess. Um, you all, did not always, uh, the, the justices did not always agree on every matter. No. Uh -huh. Was that part of, was that a weakness or a strength of the court? It's a strength. Mm -hmm. In other words, you you know, it's, we see things differently. Mm -hmm. And most of the time we can make an adjustment to something that needs to be changed. I, I, I used to, I, I used to always say, now look, if you're worried about the way I phrase this, mm -hmm. you know, let's can change, it. change. We can change it, but it's but it. I'm not going to change the principle of it. Right. In other words, it's going to remain the same. But how how it is phrased is we we can work with. But uh, that sounds like a very good collegial we approach. Had a, we had a wonderful collegial approach. This was the only time, only time on the on the code that we had any kind of the trouble whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And it was actually against, uh, against the federal court here. Right. Is what it was, mm -hmm. and just disregarding uh, what it had done. So mm -hmm. it was, it was <laughs> just wrong. Mm -hmm. And um, so the court, it seems then, once all of that passed, returned to the, the good collegial approach um, in the remainder of your time on the court. Yes, we did, right. That's good. Um, let's talk for a minute about then, um, and we'll see what sort of influence this may have had on your understanding or, or your legal philosophy or your practice of law. Um, the, let's talk, start with like the feminist movement. There's been a big change since you came into uh, practicing law in the role that uh, women have, both in um, practicing law and being uh, in judicial circles and so forth. Um, has that had a, uh, has that been a big change, a big stretch, or has that sort of been a natural progression? It's been a natural progression for me. It's just a slow regression, mm -hmm. you know, a slow profession. But it, uh, I mean, it, it was good that it came, right. and it certainly was helpful. Mm. And, and the same with the civil rights movement. I know it yeah, was, uh, exactly. right. Any particular memories of things there that? I, no, I don't remember those exactly. I remember the things about the court because I have pictures of each court, except the one with the- mm -hmm, With the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments <laughs> person on it in, in my, uh, condo down at the beach and in the office right across the street here. Mm -hmm. And so I look at it every day to think about the people and so many of them are dead, you know, right. because time does pass, but it's, uh, it, 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 it's just wonderful to and those are all work with those memories, people. Working with each of those courts. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. That's good. Any other influences that you can think of that were strong in how you um, practice law or how you served decisions you made? I, I don't think so. Okay. One last thing I'll ask about all of that is, 
Uh, you're, so, you're pretty well known for uh, writing beautiful opinions. Uh, I have people all the time telling me that they, some of them have saved those opinions. They were so well written and they reference scripture or they reference literature and so forth. Um, tell us about your approach to writing your, the opinions, the ones you wrote. It was just the approach I took. I mean, it's part and parcel of who I am, mm -hmm. I think, because I certainly didn't try to right, do to something. Be, to decorate. <laughs> I wasn't trying to decorate. I was just trying to put in it what was I thought needed to be there. Mm -hmm. But you drew from what, Daddy? You're, I mean, you've always loved to write. Yeah. Classic literature, that scripture, right. other uh, other opinions that have been written. Other opinions, right. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, well, that's pretty much it. Is it safe to say you spent a good bit of time working on those opinions? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, some more than others. I mean, some were just hard to decide, others were not, mm -hmm. and hard to write, and others were not. Mm -hmm. But it, it can be done if you just uh, set about doing it. Let's talk about your role as a bar commissioner for a number of years. Um, do you remember what particularly you had to do by being a, what were some of the duties you had? Oh, I, well, it, we had the office right next to the old courthouse mm -hmm. in Montgomery, and uh, which was also the building that I went into when I went on the, you know, right. went on the court. And... Uh, there we were just trying to take care of the law as it would be throughout the state mm -hmm. and trying to make sure that everybody adhered to, you know, the, the law. Right. And, and that involved reading an awful lot of bar exams, oh, didn't yes. it? <laughs> <laughs> it did. Yeah. Uh, Tremendous number of bar exams. Right. And so for a number of years, yeah. Which section of the bar did you, were you an examiner for, Dad? Um, several. Was it? Oh, yeah, I did not just Was have, one decedents of states? Uh, decedents of states were definitely one of them, but, but there were several over the course of the years. And so in many ways, you, um, you were uh, very involved in deciding who was able to be um, admitted to the bar because you were one of the examiners, correct? Yes. Yeah. Well, that is a fascinating role you served in that time. Dad, tell us a little bit more about your relationship with Harper Lee. I know you met her when you were very young, but as you got older and she published To Kill a Mockingbird, did you see her pretty regularly? Yes, uh, <clears throat> we would see her. <clears throat> very regularly for a while. And a lot of times we would go to the beach and, and stop by uh, Monroeville to see her on the way, coming back and or, and or going to the beach. So we uh, maintained a good relationship for a long period of time. Uh, she got... Uh, uh, well, right before she died, she was having a little problem. Mm -hmm. But you, even in Eufaula, when you were growing up, you would see her. Oh, yes. Some there. yes. She was, uh, we were close to the Connors always, because when we were in Eufaula, we were on uh, Cherry Street and they were on Carlby Street, which was a block apart. And then when uh, they both built houses on Country Club Road right together, you know, and she had a little uh, place in the, in the yard where she worked, I mean, a little, little building there, mm -hmm. structure, so. And so um, Louise Connor mm -hmm. was Harper Lee's sister. That's right. Um, and the name Jean Louise uh, for Scout in the book is, is, is after, after Louise. Louise. And so two doors down from your, your mother's house. Exactly. And so they were in and out. And then, as I recall, Nell Harper Lee would come to Eufaula, particularly holiday time and all, because uh, 
that was a good place to celebrate with all the children that Louise and Hank had. Is that right? Exactly. Yeah. That was right. Well, that's kind of a fun relationship to have nurtured through the years. And then all of the letters you sent back and forth, the correspondence, um, that's, that, that sort of immor immortalized that relationship. Well, I thought it was good to have it res preserved in the, in the uh, Department of Archives and History. Mm -hmm. You know, for for those, but I thought we needed something also to. Other than that, and that's the reason I did this. Right. Neil Harper Lee and we because we had and and I'm ended up with this. this is the one, only one I have. I bet I had a hundred and fifty or so, or more than that, probably published. Mm -hmm. But um, people wanted it, and I was glad to you know give it to them. Mm -hmm. But I, and I may need to print it some more because mm -hmm. I may need to. Because it has everything about her. But from the excerpt that you read when she talked about how you stood for these things, you, did you know those were important to her? The rule of law? You I, know. I didn't particularly think of her you know, being important, but I was just shocked when, she, when I received that in the letter. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, her book, which was published in 1960, is that correct? Right in there, yeah. may have had as much to do with um, uh, giving, uh, in many ways, uh, advancing the civil rights movement as just about anything else. Because here you had a small town attorney who took uh, an unpopular position of defending someone who needed defending and who was wrongly accused. Right. Uh, and even though um, that trial did not turn out as we would hope it would. Right. Nevertheless, the drama in all of that played out much of what was going on in the South Monroeville. and in Monroeville yeah. and in Barber yeah. County right. and in Eufaula and other places, right? right? So in many ways that book influenced many of us, Yes. right? Yes. And continues to. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about other influences. Um, I remember in your office in the court, in your private office, you had um, a little plaque there that you placed on the wall that said, from the scripture, from the book of Micah, that said, what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justice and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Uh, how did you choose that? Why did you put that in your office? My favorite, favorite Bible of verse, I mm -hmm. think. Oh, it, one of them, anyway. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but I've always liked it. And uh, In many ways, people, some people think it's the thesis of the entire Bible, <laughs> that all of the Bible, all of the Ten Commandments, all of the Gospel is about uh, our own lives, yes. uh, seeking justice, doing mercy, and walking humbly. with great humility uh, with our God. Right. And certainly that seems to be the way you have lived your life. Well, appreciate it. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> <laughs> in your decision to, in fact, I think it even guided your decision to come back to Eufaula. You were leaving the Judge Advocate General's office in the United States Air Force, and there were offers to go to um, booming cities like Houston and other places where you would have been part of a large law firm. But you chose to go and start a law practice in the sleepy little town of Eufaula. Um, Tell us what motivated that. Well, Martha wanted to go to Houston. <laughs> uh, and uh, I thought it was probably a pretty good idea. But it did have um, my mother, you know, was still there. And she and, was widowed. And, and widowed. And uh, Celeste was in and out of there, uh, my sister. Mm -hmm. And so we just, uh, and and. Martha's family, brothers, and so forth, and, and Clara were there. Mm -hmm. And we just felt like we needed to come back there. Okay, so it came back because of the family ties and needs. Right. Primarily, yeah. And it ended up being a, a good decision in many ways. A little sleepy Eufaula kind of woke up. You all may have been part of the waking up of Eufaula, but the Corps of Engineers was a big part of that, weren't it helped, they? It helped them. <laughs> <laughs> As the lake was yeah. owned. And, and of course, they were condemning property like Rip, you know, and mm -hmm. we owned a lot of that property that uh, 
was condemned. Now the lake is over it. Mm -hmm. Now the lake is over it, is right. <clears throat> but, uh, so all of a sudden people in Eufaula had money, cash money. Right. And so no wonder there was investment in new banks and new opportunities that came about, right? It did, and a lot of people with money came mm -hmm. to Eufaula at that time. Okay. It was, it was right interesting. It hasn't changed now. Mm -hmm. It's back the way that it was. <laughs> That's right. They are redoing the hotel, though. Where you grew up. Where I grew up. And, uh, well, where I started, anyway. Mm -hmm. Anyway, they, uh, they are redoing that and uh, are going to make a nice place. I loved that hotel because I would, uh, I'd had a second floor balcony. I ran it right out of our door. I could run in and it, cars were right there and I could run up and down the yeah. balcony and so forth. And, right in downtown. Right in downtown. And uh, we, I, I would have a nurse who would help me some when I didn't have Lymus all the time. And we would go to the theater, which was half a block from there. Mm -hmm. And I enjoyed sitting in the balcony seats, mm -hmm. which we did because it was segregated at the time. But I thoroughly enjoyed being in the balcony. Mm. And, uh, you know, I really preferred doing that rather than going with my parents to see it having to sit <laughs> downstairs. But uh, it, was, uh, it, it was just little things like that mm -hmm. that happened. And, of course, there right beside it is this huge Confederate monument mm -hmm. that uh, stands facing the river. And it's, it's right by it. And that, underneath that was a, a place that we used as a playground. Oh, that playground. And, we would, and that would be our place to, to bring people from their homes. Mm -hmm. Most of them lived in regular homes, not in hotels, you know. <laughs> so we would go to that, uh, that spot, big spot behind the, the Confederate monument. And you lived in the hotel because your dad was running it? He was, he was, he was running it and he wanted to. And... My grandfather wanted me there. Mm -hmm. And he and his wife well, lived yeah. there. Yeah. But there weren't other apartments that other oh, no. people... Oh, yes, yes, there were. There were uh, several uh, older women okay. who, who did not have a husband or something and, and, and needed they some did. help. And they had a, a wonderful bar and a, they would have, they had lifts. You know, to take you could get the tray would come up in a lift, right. and and I was able to monitor with with one of my nurses riding up and down the lift, oh, like a dumb waiter. Like a dumb waiter. That's what it was, you know. And so we'd go from the first floor up to the second. It wouldn't go all the way to the third floor, right. but it would go from those two floors. And so we were, it it was interesting, you know, being able to do that and. Then all of a sudden, go to somewhere where you just had a house and a yard made it kind of different. <laughs> lots of stairs at the lots hotel, of lots of things to do, yeah. seeing people. Seeing people and, and good food. I mean, we always had good food. Well, the, the um, you mentioned about segregation. That was pretty tightly enforced, I guess. And then while you were practicing law, most of those signs disappeared. Right. Most of those restrictions disappeared. Yeah. Um, there was great discord about that. Um, any insight into that that needed to happen, was, should have happened, or concerns about it, or where were you in that? I would go to several of the churches. I remember frequently going to the Catholic Church mm -hmm. when they would have some uh, people who were having problems. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, that had been, my other grandparents lived right across the street from that. From up, Redeemer Catholic Church. Redeemer mm -hmm. Catholic, up the, uh, up, up the road, up the hill. And it, it would be, we would just go in and visit with a priest and mm -hmm. have, a, you know, a good time mm -hmm. with it. But it just, uh, you follow was a fine place. We enjoyed it mm -hmm. very much. Mm -hmm. And uh, it still is. Mm -hmm. it, yeah. It's a wonderful place, wonderful memories from there, right? Then um, 
any other influences as you think back of uh, either people or events that really had a strong influence on the court or on your philosophy or your practice? Well, on, on the courts, there were several justices whom I really respected. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just thought that they handled their cases wonderfully well and were beautifully presented. And I just, uh, you know, admired them very much. Uh, that would be the main, the main thing. The earliest memory I have of doing any campaigning <laughs> was when you had me in front of the A&P handout cards for <laughs> Howell Heflin for Chief okay. Justice. <laughs> um, so that was a fun time too, wasn't it? And, and Howell Heflin was a very good person. I enjoyed him very much. And he had a huge influence on the state. Yeah. And then Frank Johnston had a huge oh, influence yeah. on the state. Really in fact, did. I wonder what would have happened had we not had a judge no, like no. him. I don't know, but it, thank goodness we did have mm -hmm. it. And Martha and I walk around this block twice a, uh, twice a day, and we always pay attention to the uh, monuments, you know, right. what I mean, proclaiming him. Right. And he made, a huge he, he, he made a huge difference. He surely did. And I know those were not easy days for him. No. no. Um, and talk a little bit about if you were offering any guidance to someone who was interested in the law. Uh, anything, any words of insight or that you would offer? I think you would need to know that you need to work hard. Okay. You would need to... Uh, be very careful in how you presented things. Mm -hmm. But real attention to detail. Real attention to detail. And, yeah. and, and then um, how about um, any, anything bother you about the law these days? Any aspects? I see all these advertisements on television and I think that has changed a lot <laughs> from the day. Anything, any part of the of the legal community that you that you find troubling, or any aspects or movements within it? Not that I can mm -hmm. think of right, right now. There are a lot of things I don't want to watch, <laughs> you know, and don't watch. Right. <laughs> I remember when you moved to a new office in Eufaula, you um, were extremely concerned. You had a sign about this big outside that that sign might be too large, that you didn't want to be appearing to be advertising. <laughs> so things have really changed from then. Well, that, that was a, a good building, was. good building. So your daughter went to law school. She did. And you obviously had great influence on her decisions doing that. Um, I assume you were pleased with oh, that yeah. decision? Yes. Okay, and um, any, anything you want to reflect on that? Well, I was pleased with both of y'all. Okay. Y'all both were excellent children. And uh, we spent a million dollars educating you both. <laughs> <laughs> At least it felt like that, didn't it, Martha? Anyway, we, we spent plenty, but we, when we go to Duke and we go to oh, all the others that you can, Virginia. Right. Virginia and all of those things, uh, that cost a little bit of money, know. you know. <laughs> <laughs> but thank goodness for Dr. Fortunate. Houston. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> thanks goodness for that. Right. Daddy, just for a few minutes, let's talk about the clerks that you had uh, when you were on the court. Because I know that was, you were very careful in selecting the people you selected and you probably saw them change. Any reflections on how you felt like they helped you or you helped them make decisions about their career? I hope I helped them make uh, decisions about their career, but all of them helped me. Hmm. Some much more than others, but... And how, for instance? How, well, just they would put that extra effort in a case that needed the extra effort, you know, and when we were writing and working on it, it uh, a lot of times that would be things, if they didn't do it, I would have to do it, you know what I mean? So it was wonderful to have them polish it off right. uh, and, and 
And I know at least one has been on the Supreme Court. Yes, that's right. One is still on the Supreme Court. Okay. Yeah. And uh, is, is, is a senior associate justice now, I believe. Okay. <clears throat> and then others went on to practice. Did any of them go to private practice? Yes. Okay. Yes, several of them went to private practice. Danny, I'm a, I have a question. Yeah. When in the course of the justices looking at a case and making a decision, writing an opinion, when people disagreed with the opinion, they would, someone would write a dissent. That's right. And I know that one of the cases that I've heard the most about, one of your cases that I heard the most about was one that you dissented with the decision, with the majority. And it had to do with a, um, in a, in a family court issue when, you know, whether or not the parents should be responsible for paying for college for their children. And the decision was that they should not um, have that responsibility, but you dissented. Do you remember that at all? I do remember that. And I remember it was a pretty lengthy and it's been used a lot in trying to get that law changed um, so that children can expect a little bit more than <laughs> that. I think it was just that they paid, but only for the state, state right. um, schools. Yeah. Do you remember much about that, or how you felt strongly about that, or why you felt strongly? I bet right, and maybe I was uh, wrong. I, I probably had m more money than most of them. You know what I mean, when I was doing that, writing that, and deciding that. But I do think it is a, it was something that should have been done. And the role of the dissent um, the dissenting viewpoint and writing that up uh, is is important, isn't it? Oh, it is important. To yes. to um, chronicle the other side of the story, what the other what the other viewpoint would be. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's it's essential almost to if you we need to vote, you know, on a case. Mm -hmm. You just need to vote unless there's some reason that you go. Cannot do it, and and there are reasons that you shouldn't do it, you know. But if you can vote and should vote, you need to vote. It needs to be done, and not just try to avoid it. Right. Because it's uh, very necessary. And then the arguments in favor, of course, end up in the majority opinion. Exactly. And then there are valid arguments on the other side that need to be uh, noted as well. Right. And when people are using those decisions and, you know, to mm -hmm. fortify their case, that's when a dissent um, can be very valuable when, you know, unexpectedly, even though it might not be the majority opinion, it could help influence a court in a different way. Right. Well, it has been a delight for my sister Millie and me to share with my dad this opportunity for him to reflect on his years as an attorney in small town Alabama, as a member of the Alabama Supreme Court, a brief stint as Chief Justice of the Alabama Supreme Court, and um, a time when he was on the staff of a, a big city uh, law firm. All of those um, he has shaped and been influenced by, and all of those he has given his very best work to. I hope you have been able to sense the, the faith, the courage, the uh, attention to detail, the hard work that have defined his life and continue to do so. And I appreciate this opportunity afforded us by this project.